And everybody is now muted. But remember, if you have a comment or question, you can unmute yourself to ask a comment or question. You can raise your hand. Preferred is to raise your hand, although it might be a little challenging because I can't see all your names listed, but I will do my best to, to glance over it from time to time. Or again, you could just unmute yourself and yell at me if, if I don't hear that you're trying to say something. So I'm going to display those 10, those 10 uh, principles that we highlighted for our walk through of the Bible. I'm going to put those up again for you on the screen. So give me one second here. And while I'm doing that, I have to eeks. There we go. I couldn't figure out how to let Sean and Gracie in without leaving the share screen. So now we're back. There we go. So on your screen, you'll see a list of principles, 10 principles. When we're walking through the Bible, these are things we want to be looking for or things we want to be doing. The first two are in blue. And these are things that I want to be doing as I'm reading the Bible. I am trying to capture what's there. So I'm not uh, at least initially using other portions of the Bible to interpret this particular passage. I want to focus on just what's in this passage. Secondly, I want to picture and feel the events that are happening. So whatever's taking place, I want to be able to kind of use my imagination to, to capture what's happening so that I get a good understanding, a good footing before I move forward in interpreting. Then number three and four are in green. That's developing topics. That is uh, defining phrases, words, and ideas, as well as solving mysteries and, and unanswered questions. So these are things I'm doing as I keep reading through the Bible. I'm taking a topic, and you can keep a notebook or, or a document on your computer or however you want to do this. Keep track of when the Bible mentions, let's say, angels, or let's say heaven like we saw last week. Uh, you want to document heaven and you want to indicate the verses that, that mentions heaven and what they say about heaven. And you're building a systematic theology through the Bible. You're letting the Bible define things for you. And then you want to keep a list of if you've ever uh, read the Bible and you found yourself asking questions because you don't have the answers, something's confusing or puzzling. And you read the passage over a couple of times, you still can't figure it out. Then take that question, write it down somewhere, and save that question. And as you read through the Bible, keep looking to see if the Bible gives you the answer elsewhere. Then the five through nine are in like a yellow oranges color. Uh, these are things that after I read it, I want to want to stop and think: Are there is there anything that is life applicable? Anything that I can apply to my life? What can I do with what I just read? Is there anything that is applicable to my life, my daily living? Uh, principles to live by. Is there any statement that I read that is a good tuck that in your memory bank and live by that type principle? Uh, affirming the Bible. Is there anything I read in the Bible that affirms that what the Bible says is reality and it's demonstrating that it is true and, and authoritative? Uh, then I'm looking to capture memory verses. Are there statements in the Bible that I should put the memory? Then I want to take hold of encouraging statements or ideas. And then the last one, number 10 in gray, I want to capture the big picture. And that's really just to kind of allow each part of the Bible you're reading to be a puzzle piece to the whole of the story of the Bible. So I'm understanding not just uh, the, this little portion, but the whole portion. So I'm, I'm going narrow when I'm trying to look specifically at the passage I'm looking at now. And then I'm going broad after I do that. I want to see how, because I'm narrow, being narrow so I can really get the, the meaning of the passage. And then once I understand the meaning, then I'm going broad so I can take that meaning to the rest of the, the Bible. So those are the 10 principles we 
we walk our way through as we're reading scripture. And in Genesis 1, I wanted to mention a uh, conversation we had last week, and, and Sean, I saw was on here, and he had mentioned, because I had said that there's something in the passage that makes me believe that these six days, now we know there's seven days, but he's creating in six days, that these six days are six literal 24-hour days as far as my interpretation, although I hold to that loosely. I don't see it as a firm black and white. And that is that at the end of each day, it says there was evening and there was morning. And, and last week, Sean had mentioned and he wasn't saying he disagreed with it being 24 literal days. And we talked about it a little further afterwards that uh, he found he, what, what, what it was is he came across an article that suggested that maybe those words mean uh, from chaos, things are moving from chaos to order because the word evening can mean chaos and the word uh, morning can mean, can mean order in the Hebrew language, which is what the Old Testament was originally written in. Uh, and then, uh, so what I want you to understand is my philosophy to Hebrew and Greek, uh, using Hebrew and Greek. And my philosophy first is be careful with Hebrew and Greek because, and Sean wasn't doing this, but I, I've heard a number of preachers preach and then they'll say and this means in the greek and then they'll say what it means in the greek and i don't know if you've ever like me saw this where you hear a preacher say this means in the greek and then you think how do they know that that's what that means in the greek because they'll list that that particular term has eight possible meanings to the word and they'll say and that's this meaning well how do they know that it's that meaning to the to the greek uh, word and the, the challenge is there's a reason why there's the, the slogan, uh, it's all Greek to me. Have you guys ever heard that? It's all Greek to me. Because Greek is a challenging language and Hebrew is even a more challenging language. And what happens is people start to learn a little bit about the language and then they try to use it. And they kind of feel like they know what they're doing. Uh, and if you've ever taken a foreign language, even a more simple language, uh, a modern language, if you take one year of, say, Spanish and think that you're going to have a fluid conversation with somebody who only speaks Spanish and not stumble your way through that conversation, you're, uh, you're probably going to make some mistakes there. And Carol can tell you that in sign language, she knows sign language that the slightest miscue in the way you shape your hands could mean all the difference from saying a good word and saying a uh, rude gesture or a swear word. Uh, and, and so there's a lot of particulars that before you attempt to use a language, you wanna make sure that you're fairly able to master that language. Uh, and so you wanna use some caution with using the Hebrew and Greek language. Uh, because none of us are, are experts in that. And, and secondly, I want to suggest that you use, and I've suggested it to other groups, there's something called the Blue Letter Bible. And uh, Joe actually uh, pointed this out to me first, and then I've spread the word about it. The Blue Letter Bible is either an app on your phone, or it is a website that you can use. And what that does is in that app, you can go to the Bible, click on a verse, and it'll list for you uh, every, in our case, every Hebrew word and what part of the passage is being translated from that particular Hebrew word. You can then click on the Hebrew word and you can play an, an audio uh, pronunciation of the word in Hebrew. Then you can get the definition of the Hebrew word. Then you can also get a listing of everywhere that particular Hebrew word is found. So sometimes you'll have a Hebrew word that's translated different ways in the English language throughout the Bible. Uh, and sometimes you'll get the same English word that will have multiple Hebrew words throughout the Bible that are used and translated into that English word. And so the Blue Letter Bible allows you to see 
everywhere that that specific Hebrew word is used, and it'll tell you how it's translated uh, every time it's used in the Bible. And the reason why that's relevant for evening and morning is when you look at the Blue Letter Bible, and it's, a, it's called a lexicon, and there are other Hebrew and Greek lexicons, that you look at the word that's translated evening and translated morning, and you, you find out a definition of it, most of the, the definitions to those words is evening for the one word and, and morning for the other word. And there is a there is an ability to define it as chaos or order. However, most of the definition options are evening and morning. And pretty much when I looked it up in the Blue Letter Bible, pretty much every time that these words are used in the Old Testament, the translators translate it evening or translate it morning. Uh, so it seems like the more uh, the more fitting within the, the usage of these words in the Bible is evening and morning. And if you'll look, anybody have uh, parallel Bibles? If you don't know what that is, parallel Bible is what lists like four translations next to each other. So you can see what the different translating translations, how they're wording a particular verse. And I, I would venture to guess that that all of the translations that you guys are using right now will say evening or morning, uh, evening and morning, because it seems to be the more fitting translation of those words. And uh, oh, I lost my thought. Uh, Anyway, so that seems to be the more fitting definition to those words is evening and morning as to the, the language there. Uh, oh, don't you hate when you lose a thought for a second? I lost a thought and it was a good one. Must not have been good enough if it didn't stay. But uh, so just be careful with the use of, uh, oh, that's what it was. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that the translation that you're using, so all the different translations, the way they came up with that translation is you have a team of, of Greek and Hebrew experts that sometimes they may or may not be Christian. The, their goal is to find someone who's an expert in the language to translate the language. And usually the translation will be coming from a team of translators. Sometimes you'll have 40, sometimes you'll have 70 individuals that are translating the Bible. And all those individuals have to agree on the best way to translate that particular Hebrew or that particular Greek word into English. And uh, if, if all or most of the translations are translating it a particular way, then you can, you can probably safely bet that the, uh, that the translation is accurate. Uh, so I, I tend to shy away from questioning how the word's defined, although sometimes it does seem to be significant, but it's been my experience that nine times out of 10, the Hebrew Greek definition does not change much of the way to translate a particular passage. So uh, just follow up from last week on Greek and Hebrew. But I think we left off at verse six, no, verse nine, because we're moving into the third day. And I want to note back up at verse two, again, it said the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now, the reason why that's significant is, does anybody know which day water gets created? Anybody know? Looking for raised hands. And again, I'm not on gallery view, so I can't see everybody at the same time. Uh, the water was either created or at least not mentioned until day three, when you have the land and the water being separated. Uh, and so what seems to be happening is you have the initial start of, in the beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth. And so you have the substances and the materials, and then the the days begin to happen in which the specific things are being created. And I, I, and I think that what happens here is, is the language is of such that 
God's not really trying to make sure we know precisely where everything's falling. Because really just the main point is that God created everything. And it, it's not really as important to get all the details together. So, and I see Heather, did you mean to raise your hand? Yeah, but it also says there, verse two, like you, I, you might have said this, the Spirit of God. Hello! Is, sorry, hovering over the waters. Yeah. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Were you going to make a point with that? Or? No, just that it mentioned that there was wa there were waters there before he said, let there be light and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I was saying is there was water yeah, first. I might be a little distracted. I'll that's put okay. me back on. There was water first, and then day three is when we see water showing up. But really, it's just saying it was dividing the land and the water. Uh, so God's, I don't think God's meaning to be exhaustive in the way he's detailing out how things were created. And it's important for us to know that because when scientists propose things that they're saying is scientific fact, now that's, again, a big question, is, is it scientific fact or scientific theory? But when the scientists are proposing scientific facts, if they have evidence that it's a scientific fact, uh, we want to make sure the Bible is not contradicting that. And if the Bible is, we're going to trust the Bible over what they're proposing. But if the Bible is not even contradicting that, then we don't need to argue over that. So, for example, the age of the earth. Uh, the Gen Genesis chapter 1 is not helping us define how old the earth is. God really doesn't care to make sure that we know how old the earth is, although I, I lean in favor of the young earth model. But, but God really doesn't care. So those details, as you can see here, the details are kind of, if you ask a lot of questions, you'll see that the details are kind of murky uh, in this passage. Now, we move on to day three. So we had day one is light and darkness. Day two is the sky, or the Bible says heaven, but it describes it as the sky. Then day three, says and god said let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear and it was so god called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas and god saw that it was good verse 11 and god said let the earth sprout vegetation plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed each according to its kind on the earth and it was so the earth brought forth vegetation plants yielding seed according to their own kind and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed each according to its kind and god saw that it was good and there was evening and there was morning the third day now here's where it gets tricky and there's some people that are critics of the bible because day one is light and darkness is created. Day four is when God creates the sun and the moon and the stars. So somehow in day one, we have light and darkness, but we don't get the sun and the moon and the stars till day four. Also, day three, we get plants. Day four, we get the sun. Now, what do plants need to survive? They they need the sun. I see, Carol, you're, you're mouthing to me. <laughs> you want to unmute yourself? I said God. That's what they need to grow. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yes, that's true. Uh, and what scientists or critics of the Bible are doing is they're saying uh, that God got it out of order. So if God's so smart and he knows that plants need sun to survive, then certainly he would have made the sun first on day three and the plant lives on day four. But they're not paying attention because on day one, there is light. It's just not coming from the sun. And interestingly right. enough, I, I had noted that there are some phrases that are mentioned with each day. One of those phrases is, it was so. And God says it was so for each day of creation except for day five and day one. And day one was when he created light and darkness, and he said it was so, or he did not say it was so. And I think that's because 
that the light coming from some other source other than the the sun, like the ball of fire sun, uh, that that this was a temporary lighting uh, that was happening uh, because he wasn't planning on the planet running off of this light uh, permanently. He was going to create a sun to carry out that light. Cindy, you raising your hand. Yeah, don't you see it there? I do. I'm just confirming because some people just bump it on accident. Oh, sorry. No, because he is the light of the world. Mm -hmm. God is light. So that's where that light is comes from before he made the sun and the moon. Yes, most likely. But remember, we want to go narrow and then wide. So, yes, we do know that from other places in the Bible. But, yeah. but in Genesis 1, we don't have that answer yet. Uh, and so, so yes, it probably is that. And, and, and I tend to think that if, if we go throughout the rest of the Bible, like, like you did there, that there's a constant th established theme of light and darkness throughout the Bible. And, and Cindy's right. When you get to Revelation, mm -hmm. who's the light in Revelation for the earth? Yeah. Jesus. Yeah, Jesus God. is the light for, for the earth, not the sun at that time. So there can be light and there can be life sustaining sources without the sun existing, which anyway, it's kind of funny that scientists uh, pick mm -hmm. apart the order that these are created. You're kind of discounting that God's just speaking things into existence so he can just kind of make things happen at this time, however he wants to. You're kind of removing the supernatural from the picture anyway. But nonetheless, there's light and darkness. And note in, in day one, when God created light and darkness, did you notice that he calls the light good, but he doesn't say anything about the darkness? doesn't call it evil, but he doesn't call it good either. Uh, he, he only calls the light good. In fact, I'll go back there. Day one. And God, verse three, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. Uh, then when he says darkness, he doesn't mention anything about the darkness being good, which makes me suspicious that the light is, uh, that the light is like the rest of the Bible. It's, it's this good and evil concept that's mm -hmm. happening, which what do we not get specifically mentioned here in creation that shows up in chapter three? Anybody know? There's something that's a created thing that doesn't show up in chapter three or doesn't show up till chapter three. That's Satan himself, isn't it? What was that Joe? Satan himself. Yes. Yes. Satan shows up in the garden in chapter three but we have no mention of the angels or demons specifically being created yet. That doesn't mean they're not being created because we also don't have elephants being mentioned here or giraffes or whales. Uh, so the Bible's not being exhaustive and detailed. And I wouldn't be surprised if somewhere in day one is when you're, where you're getting the, the angelic beings, uh, but we don't know. We have no, a uh, specific verse that is telling us, at least in Genesis, where where the angels came from, and obviously Satan falls before we get to chapter three. Uh, so those are interesting things to note. Was someone saying something? I uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, darkness is what I understand by science wasn't created, but it's just the absence of light. There you go. Yes, you're correct. Uh, so the question is, is whether or not darkness is a thing, uh, or it's just the not the the ex no no light is there. So it's the that light is not right. existing. So it's dark. It's a it's a void. Yes. Uh, so that could be the reason why he only called the light good and didn't call the darkness good. Although, he just called the darkness night. <laughs> yeah. So what we'll do is you'll keep those concepts in mind. And so as you read through the rest of the Bible, you're looking to see, does God give us any explanation to this light darkness, uh, this intriguing light darkness thing that's sitting here? And it's intriguing, intriguing because there is no uh, sun, moon, stars, and those sort of things that are, that are surfacing at this time. 
Uh, so day three is you get the plant life and you get uh, the seeds being divided. Uh, notice that that we're not being told that we have multiple bodies of land or multiple bodies of water. It doesn't mean that we don't have that, but we're not being told that we do. And what do evolutionary scientists believe about our land masses on our planet? Where were they situated in their minds? Pangea. What was that? Pangea, though everything was together at first. Yeah. So every everything was one giant landmass, and it was the the plates of the planet that, as they were shifting, things began to separate and move in different places. And when you read the Genesis one account, that is possible. Nothing in Genesis one, nothing really in the beginning stages of Genesis tells us that there had to have been separate landmasses. Nothing says that they had to be one either. But we don't have to reject those ideas because of the Bible. Uh, again, we don't have to affirm them either. So we want to make sure as we're walking through the Bible that we're not rejecting ideas not based on what the Bible is telling us. So the only uh, thing the only thing there is, Danny, is it says that the seas are is plural, multiple seas. It's not just one big ocean. Yeah, that's the only clue that there that there could be. Yeah, I would be curious, and this is where, I, as much as I said I hesitate with, with the Hebrew and Greek language, I'd be curious to, to look into what that particular word is meaning there that's translated seas. Uh, but yes, you're right. Although it also says in verse 20, did I jump ahead? I did. But I'm going to, since I caught, it caught my eye. Have you ever scanned through the Bible and something catches your eye and you're like, wait, what does that say? Uh, <laughs> You'll notice that in verse 21, so God created the sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm, and it's a plural form of waters. Uh, using the plural form doesn't necessarily mean that we have multiple waters necessarily. Uh, so it, the, the language here is, is kind of intriguing to me. And, and that's really my more, more my point, Steve, is that there's options. When we read this passage, we have options. It, it could be that these are 24 literal, literal days, but it might not be. It could be that God did it all in six days and there was no interval of time between verses one and two and the rest, but there might have been an interval of time. It could be that there was one landmass, but there might not have been. Uh, so there's a vagueness to, to scripture here, uh, but good. Very good. Thanks, Steve. All right, so verse 14, we move on to day four, and it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, and for days and years, and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. Now, it says that okay. that the the sun, moon, and stars are for are for signs. Now, some people believe in astrology uh, or interpreting the signs of the stars uh, as as giving us some kind of message hidden in the stars. Uh, anybody know what? What is in the newspaper that is based off of astrology? Anybody? Horoscopes. Yeah, oh, horoscopes are based off astrology. You're looking to the stars for signs. There's also uh, particular uh, months. If you're born a particular month, you have a certain thing attached to you. What's that called? Anybody know? Your astrological sign. Astrological sign? Is one a, is, is zodiac a thing too? Yeah, the zodiac. The zodiac, zodiac signs. So those yeah. are things that are based on astrology, not not based on any factual thing that you can observe. It's just well, the stars are in certain positions, and so that's a sign. Now, is this passage here when it says that the the stars and the sun and moon are for signs? Is this passage referring to that? And if it is, what verses do we have to tell us that? And if it isn't, 
what are these verses, what is it in these verses that is telling us it is not referring to that kind of sign? Anybody? I think that God let the, um, let the things in the heavens be the signs that he is speaking to us, signs, signs that he gives us, um, not for us to rule our lives by these signs. But there have been predictive signs, uh, like for prophecies, that certain signs would appear in the heavens. And uh, like the star, uh, the Bethlehem star, um, different things, the sun turned to blood, the, uh, the moon's turned to blood, the sun darkened, things like that. Okay. Well, remember, in this passage, we want to go narrow first. So what in this passage tells me? It's time. Yes. It tells the time. time. Se seasons. Yes. Thank okay. you, Steve. Times and seasons. Yeah, it says, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. So, so the signs is for us keeping track of time, like Steve said. Oh, so yes. we're able to, by the way the stars are in the sky, we're able to, to keep track of time. Uh, uh, and so it's important as we're reading through the Bible to capture context. Remember I said that one of our 10 principles is to have a good imagination, so to be able to picture what's there. The only problem with an imagination is if anybody has a great imagination, you can picture what's there and what's not there. And we want to make sure that we're not doing that. Uh, and so when we imagine, we're trying to get context here. And, and for this, now, Mary, that doesn't mean the Star of David you mentioned, there was a Star of David and it led them to uh, Jesus. There is uh, the, the different signs, uh, the ap apocalyptic signs that you have in other places in the Bible. But for here, signs just means for timing uh, as far as the lights are concerned. Then verse 15, and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. Now, it said that God set them in the expanse. Now, the the Bible the Bible says that uh, it, you'll see the Bible at various points say the sun rises and the sun sets and scientists will point that out and they'll point it out as a criticism that that we know scientifically the sun does not move move the sun stays still but it's the Earth that rotates around the sun so the sun's not actually rising or setting. And so they think that the that God should have known that, so he shouldn't have used the terminology rising or setting. And there's a couple of things there. One, do you guys still say sunrise, even though you know the sun's not literally rising? I see some some shaking of heads. Uh, we still use the terminology sunrise and sunset just because that's that's how we refer to it, even though we know that the sun isn't rising itself, the earth is, is turning and that's how we're, we're seeing the sun. But it said here that, the, that God set them in the expanse. He, he placed them in a location, uh, which again, vague, so maybe, maybe not. But I tend to think that that might mean that God was uh, placing them in a location that they were gonna stay. So God set the sun in its spot and it stays there. Now the moon, however, and I, I, the moon does move, uh, but it moves around the earth. So, so uh, again, just a thought, something to throw out there. And it is interesting to me still that we're in day four and God created these things to separate the light from the darkness. But in day one, we already had a separating of the light and darkness. And then we have it again in day four. So we're not looking to be exact on details here. God's intention is just to tell us how we came to be uh, is through God's voice speaking things into existence in an orderly creative fashion not to nitpick on on the way things are laid out and the language is showing us that the language is showing that God's not attempting to be exact here 
scientifically. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. Uh, verse 20, verse 20, we move on to day five. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good and God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there is evening and there is morning the fifth day. Uh, so he said the great sea creatures. Does anybody know what the great sea creatures are? Loch Ness Monster. Okay, Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> the whales. Whales, okay. Uh, and really, we probably, and that was a trick question, we probably don't know what the great sea creatures were. There's, uh, as we, if, you, if you've uh, learned about uh, animal life in the ocean, there's all kinds of large animals that live in the ocean. This could be any number of them. Yeah. Or, or it could be a m multiple species that, that it's referring to. Uh, it doesn't have to be a, a dinosaur. It doesn't have to be some animal that's not presently existing. It could, uh, but we just know that there's some large uh, animal life that is now existing in the, in the ocean. Uh, at least that's what I would assume with the great uh, sea creatures. I'm trying to look, that, look for that statement again. Uh, great, yeah, great sea creatures. I'm assuming that means large, uh, but, but maybe it means something different. It might not even mean large necessarily. Uh, and this is where Hebrew maybe could help us some, uh, but even then I, I doubt it. And Pastor? What's that? Pastor? Um, in my study Bible, it says sea creatures are literally sea monsters. And then it gives two references, one in Jeremiah, one in Ezekiel. But this Hebrew word is also translated serpent and gives references. Um, in this context, the word designates all the large mammals and fish of the sea. The reuse of the verb create, well, no, that goes on to something else. I just thought that was interesting. Yeah, so, and even then, that, that doesn't really give us a specific answer. Exactly. Uh, yeah. We just know that it's, whatever this is, is probably intimidating, whether it's intimidating by its size or by its power or its looks, whatever it is, uh, it's, it's a great thing, whatever this is. Uh, is that the term Leviathan, or is that something on the earth? I think that that comes in Job, uh, I think. And, and maybe right, he other, said, yeah. "Did you were you there when I created the Leviathan? Yeah, and, so I don't think that that's this word, but I, I could be mistaken. Uh, but I didn't know if it was a sea creature or something on the land. I couldn't remember. Yeah, I don't remember for sure either on that one. Uh, <laughs> so... Notice that, what are we on, day five here? Uh, day three and day five, we get introduced to uh, that these things are now re reproducing things. So before, when you had the sun, moon, and stars, they're not reproducing. Uh, light and darkness is not reproducing the waters. But when you get to the plant life in day three, they're reproducing according to their kind. When you get to day five, you get the birds and the, the water animals are reproducing according to their kind. And in day five, you get them told to uh, multiply or to be fruitful and multiply again according to their kind. And you're going to get that repeated in day six, verse 24. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds livestock and creeping things that creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds and it was so and god made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind and god saw that it was good uh now we'll we're gonna get to man in a second here but so we get animal life here 
at day six, we get the animals and day five, we get the, the birds and the, the sea animals. Day three, we get plants and, and all of those items are to be reproducing according to their kinds. Uh, does anybody know what the word kinds is talking about? Species. Species? Anybody else? Yeah, I would say that too. Okay. Uh, the, the only challenge with that is it's saying that they're only reproducing according to its kind. So uh, a, a poodle is a species of a dog, but a spoodle, a, a spoodle, <laughs> a, a <laughs> poodle can reproduce with another species of dog. And so mm -hmm. if, if the word kind means species, then the Bible is not correct because you can cross produce across species. Uh, and so I, I would propose that it's not species. Otherwise, uh, things aren't reproducing according to their kind. So what is another option? It means their kind of uh, animal, not necessarily the, the species, their, the classification of animal. Classification. I couldn't yeah. remember the term. Yeah. yeah. And there's, uh, in fact, if I were to Google it right now, which I think I'm going to do. Don't you love Google? Yeah. Google is such a fun thing. I encourage you when you're studying the Bible to use Google. It says in Genesis 3, verse 7, thou shalt use Google in okay. studying the Bible. Uh, now, nobody check me and read Genesis 3, 7. <laughs> uh, I'm kidding, of course. Um, I'm looking up. There's a chart for animal classifications. And here we are. You have species is the 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 lowest denominator as far as uh, the more specific denominator. Then above that you have uh, the genus. The genus, yes. Uh, and then above that you have family. Above that you have order. Above that you have class. Then phylum. Then kingdom. Then uh, I can't see past this X here. It's a, looks like a D word, maybe domain, but. Uh, there's all kinds of classes and everything falls under these classifications and we don't know because that's the cool thing and I've often wondered this when I'm reading uh, species of animals are being named in the Bible like have you ever read the Bible and it says the uh, the hyena or some off-the-wall mm -hmm. species it names mm -hmm. and my thought always goes to how did they know that that Hebrew word meant that very precise species of animal that's not been very, really mentioned commonly uh, in the biblical text. Uh, that's a good question. Because that's, that's very, uh, there's a large array of species. And so it's intriguing right. when the Bible translates, uh, or when the translators tra translate specific animals. Yeah, like there's coyotes and wolves and, you know, all those different ones that are all like dogs, but a hyena's pretty specific yeah. yeah so so i think that uh we have to remember that the language is there and remember that we're go going from one language to another and so when it says kind uh i'm going to have to do some interpretation there i'm going to have to pay attention to, to, to life and i can tell by this reading here that it cannot be species but there are scientists that will use this to criticize the bible and say, well, look, you have different species of dogs that are reproducing with one another and crossbreeding and creating new species. And the Bible said that they're only going to reproduce according to their kind. Well, what you'll find out is anybody know the difference between micro and macro evolution? No. Micro evolution is when things are evolving within a restricted location. So, like, there are some morphing of species that are happening but they're not crossing over a larger uh, classification. Uh, Macroevolution is when things are evolving from larger classifications. So micro would be, we have a new species of dog because there's crossbreeding. Macroevolution would be that we ended up with a half a fish and half a dog uh, because they're jumping from a larger category. Uh, and so when the Bible says kind, I tend to think it's referring to one of the terms that are higher than species. Uh, do I know which one? I have no idea uh, which one it is, but we know scientifically 
uh, apart from evolutionary theory, which is again just theory, uh, but by scientific evidence, we know that that dogs can't reproduce with cats, cats can't reproduce with fish, humans can't reproduce with other animals. Uh, there is a limitation to the the way things reproduce, and it affirms the Bible because the Bible said that things are only going to reproduce uh, according to their kind. So again, it's it's very important to make sure that we are paying attention to details because we can give the critics of the Bible ammunition to criticize the Bible, but, but wrongly give them ammunition because uh, their critics are not valid. Their, the criticism is not valid. Uh, now, verse 26 says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth so god created man in his own image in the image of god he created him male and female he created them there are all kinds of good things in these three verses here uh no two verses actually the first is god said let us make man uh what's significant to that god said let us anybody the trinity they're talking to each other yes thank you you got god singular saying us plural saying our plural uh and so god is speaking in a pluralistic form but he's also singular uh and so we got our first shedding some light on god's nature that he is a plural singular god which is again the trinity is such a perplexing thing but you see it here now the jehovah's witnesses would tell you that god is speaking to the angels god <laughs> is saying hey angels let's make man in our own image uh, because they don't believe in the trinity now when we look at these two verses what statements in these verses would tell us that god can't be speaking to the angels us i don't even what's that carol do you got something <laughs> you clock because he said, of us. oh us that could ha only mean the godhead i would think okay according it to just, our likeness it just says god are, says it doesn't say god said to the angels that's true but but absence doesn't necessarily uh invalidate that claim what about according to our likeness because men are not made in the likeness of angels. Yes, there you go. Verse 27, uh, in the image of God, uh, he created him. Uh, so he no, it was in 26. It says, according to our likeness with a capital O, our. Well, but remember the capital is, is a translation. Okay. But I mean, according to our likeness was in verse 26 still. Yeah, so we don't don't get definition just based on the use of us and our. We get okay. definition when we get to 27 that man okay. is made specifically in the image of God. Mm -hmm. Man is not made in the image of angels. He's made in the right. image of God. Uh, and so because of that, when God says, let us make man in our image, he cannot be referring to any other being but God because God is the image that we're, we're made in. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so the Jehovah's Witnesses are wrong there. So I encourage you, if the Jehovah's Witnesses come to your door, invite them in and show them the right way. And, Amen. And if, if you get stuck that they assert something that you can't answer, then just call me. Uh, and if you can't get me, I, I, I can tell you from experience, because I've witnessed, witnessed two Jehovah's Witnesses, just get their phone number and a schedule a meeting time with them and allow me to come but what i'll what will happen is if you tell them you're going to bring your pastor they'll say okay i'm going to bring this other person they, they try to either match your numbers or uh have greater numbers uh when they when they converse with you so uh keep that in mind but uh you can show them in the bible but danny there are their ways who's saying that is that heather for their sake though yeah for witnessing sake is there something that says i'm just looking at these verses that the angels were not created in God's image. 
You mean that people were not created in the image of angels? Because that's no, that's that a, the angels weren't created in the image of God. No, that angels like so. If so, we have to know first that angels aren't created in the image of God, or that it could, or it, you know, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah, but like, I think it's that, not going to prove much with these verses if angels and humans are created and they're both created in the image yeah, of God. But I think the question isn't whether or not I angels, agree with you, I'm just saying, witnessing. Yeah, uh. Yeah. So the, the question will be is if they get tripped up over language and not using the language correctly. Because uh, the question isn't, are angels made in God's image? The, the question is we're trying to figure out who's, who's the us and, and our. And, and verse 27 shows us that, that we are made in God's image. Uh, and since we are the ones that are made in God's image, when he says, let us make man in our image, it has to the hour has to be uh god but th you're right they will argue with you uh so again if you i'm just saying that if okay I'll, i might i might not be following later. what you're saying uh i don't think so but we could talk about it later okay no problem uh so let's go to oh actually you prepared for that danny am i prepared for that or are you telling me to be prepared for that <laughs> i'm saying you should be because it's going to happen <laughs> and I don't have an ability this conversation with me <laughs> <laughs> and once I once I close this meeting I don't have the ability to mute her either <laughs> <laughs> although I you got that right <laughs> although I can mute myself and I have used that tactic before. but uh, Danny, you are, like you, uh, but it, like you said, Danny, we got to get back to narrow. With it, we're we're in this chapter, in chapter one, and it only it only talks about God and man. It doesn't have any reference to angels in there. Yes. So gr grammatically and contextually, you really can't insert angels to be the author hour. Uh, but but Heather is right, at least part of what I'm understanding, because I'm obviously not understanding all of it, that, that they will still try to find a way to argue with you on, on the way you're trying to interpret that, because uh, they don't like Pastor, to lose. But uh, I have a question, Pastor. I yes. have a question. Yes, Joni. You're talking about creating human beings here in God's image. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Is this before or after Adam and Eve? Before. No comment. <laughs> Safe. <laughs> Actually, you're, you're getting a bit ahead of us, which is fine. Uh, my my guess would be uh, that that the the men the the human beings that are being created here are Adam and Eve. Uh, however, when we get to chapter two and chapter three, uh, maybe even chapter four, those first four chapters. There's a lot of questioning of where did all these people come from, uh, and and there's some possible answers to that. Uh, but like I said, if the Bible's being vague, we want to try to stay vague. Also, uh, we can have our guesses, but then we have to make sure that a, we don't want to be like those scientists who claim scientific fact when they only have a theory. Uh, and so I I want to encourage you to make sure that you classify this is my guess or this is my theory rather than uh, I know that this is what the Bible is, is asserting here. Uh, would, it, now, would, it be, would it be safe to say like Moses is just giving like an overview of things? Well, and, and again, we're, we're, we're heading then in that direction because chapter okay. one tells the creation story and then chapter two tells another creation story. And the question is, are they telling two, these two chapters telling two different creation stories? Uh, or is chapter one telling it one way and chapter two is telling it in a more specific way or with a different angle in mind uh, is the question. So, so those questions are coming. Uh, so I'm not going to answer you until three weeks from now. <laughs> okay, May the 18th. Okay. Yeah, yeah, right. So mark your calendar is May the 18th. That we're going to answer Joni's questions. <laughs> uh, now it says, and let them have dominion over the, and it lists the different things. Uh, 
Who is the them here? Man. Man. In and what is dominion? Control. Uh, yeah, yeah, some kind of control. Now we don't have it detailed out what authority? That, Would authority, it be authority? Perhaps. Uh, so we don't have this detailed out what that specifically means. So that mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily mean that I have the authority to do with creation whatever I want to. Uh, but it does bear in mind some form of responsibility. We have some kind of responsibility when it comes to creation. That doesn't mean that I that I have to recycle or that I have to plant trees. It could mean <laughs> that, uh, but it but it doesn't really give us specifics here. Other than we want to take away from this is that I have some kind of responsibility when it comes to creation, and so that's something we want to do a, multiple things with. We want to reflect on it with the Lord. We want to be mindful of it when we're interacting with creation. And we want to jot that down to see if God is going to expound upon that idea as we work our way through the Bible. Because he's telling us a command here. He's saying, have dominion. And so I need to understand what it is to have, have dominion over these things. Uh, which, Danny, yes. in my, in my um, Nelson's Bible reference, it says dominion means supreme authority to govern. Okay. That's what dominion is. Yeah, but as far as what I do with that authority is 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 the question. How, how does that look? So right. I, oh, I, I see. I have some kind of authority. I have some measure of responsibility. But what what is that telling me to do? Uh, to yeah, create? it says it's delegated by God. It's under God's control, and it is and it can be misused. And it shows the scriptures for that under man's dominion. Yeah, and again, it's still vague for us. So yeah. if I were to walk out and take a hike in the woods and exercise dominion, what does that look like? You know what I mean? Like, uh, I don't have details there. So that, that's something we want to keep plugged away as we work our way through uh, this Cute passage. Animals. I want to make sure I didn't miss anything else in here. I want you to keep in mind that we're made in God's image uh, because that's going to become significant when we get to chapter three. And... Uh, do we want to go there? What time does your clock say? Does it, is it 7.30, right? 7.59. 7.29, you said? No, 7.30. <laughs> uh, try to get another 30. Uh, oh, it's eight. Uh, it's eight. There is some question when, when it says God created him, male and female. Um, D, hold on one second. DJ, hold on. Hey, Heather, are you still out there? Thank you. I had a, a child pounding at the door. I had to send in the guard. Um, take dominion over him. What's that? Take dominion. You need to take dominion over DJ. I do. I need to take dominion over DJ. <laughs> um, Good luck with that. Now, I don't know what that entails, though. Yeah, me either. <laughs> uh, so we'll end on verse 27 says he created them in the image of God. He created them male and female. If you'll notice in the King James translation, it gives us some question of whether or not man and woman is created in God's image and whether or not God has male and female in mind when he says man. Most translations, the wording seems to imply it, it, it's speaking of both genders. Uh, but just know that there's some language there that is... Uh, peculiar and you'll have to google uh woman is the the image of or no how's it worded We're, woman is the image of man i want to say uh corinthians i think it's in corinthians or you can google bible there's a passage in the bible that says that man is made in the image of god and woman is made in the image of of man so just explore that on your own uh we're at 801 so we won't explore that today uh, so we'll pick up at verse 28 next week. Uh, and we only have a few more vet verses in that chapter. So uh, that's it. So let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to study your word together. And we ask that you would continue to help us to have open eyes to see what you're showing to us in the word of God. Uh, we thank you for the life that you give us and the truth that you give us. And help us to know it more and live it out more. Uh, help us to know what it is to have dominion over our uh, environment, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.